and welcome to the 6th of December and the next window for the Two Fat Lardies Advent Calendar for 2021. We've got a cracker today, um, so sit down, pull yourself up a glass of wine or port or maybe a cup of coffee and enjoy Richard talking about the inspiration behind pint-sized wargaming campaigns. I've loved them, I hope you have, and here's the reasoning and thinking and inspiration behind how they came into being. Take it away, Rich. Ever since the first games that Nick and I designed together, our, our focus has always been on the human experience rather than the technical or mechanical side of warfare. And Nick likes to say that when you're being shot at, the small details of whether it's a brain or an MG34 are not really the first thing on your mind. Our approach has tended to be in, uh, inspired by a couple of books. I know Nick talks about At the Sharp End by John Ellis. But for me, the big Damascene moment was reading John Keegan's classic 1976 book, uh, The Face of Battle. Uh, the book was groundbreaking in that it bridged the great man approach of traditional political history as proposed by you know Thomas Carlyle and social history in that it considered the experiences of the men who fought and how they fought rather than just the big decisions made by the leaders at the top. Um, and the shift in the way history is being considered as, as a result, I think, of, of that book and obviously the work of other historians, but that, that was a seminal moment in uh, military history, certainly. And the shift in the way that it's considered is, I think, is interesting and it's actually mirrored in the way War Games rules have developed. Older rules, older historians as well, or those with a more traditional approach, tend to follow that great man model where... Uh, what's important are the decisions that the commander makes, you know, and in history it, it's the, the kings, the generals, the presidents, the great men that uh, lead their country through, you know, various events. Uh, and, you know, the older war games rules tend to follow that approach. Um, you know, the, the, it's the great man, the, the leader on the battlefield, will make the important decisions. And after that, his men will then carry out their instructions without hesitation, deviation, or whatever else it is. Um, and what we've attempted to do is to move our game design to the point where leadership is about making your plan. And then the harder part is actually implementing it. Um, in our approach, leadership doesn't emanate from just one central figure at the top, but it's found at all levels. And that lower level leadership is absolutely vital in achieving objectives because you know, leadership is the fuel that drives a plan forward to success or failure. So um, with leadership being at the very heart of the game systems and people being at the heart of the game systems, we're always keen to see players care about what happens to their miniature men. And we've got a fair amount of a stick over the years as a result of the way we name our leaders. There's some fairly well-known silly names that uh, we've used uh, uh, over time, most of which are slightly distasteful um, or possibly even dubious in many ways. Um, but we do that for a reason. It's not just because we're being daft. We do it because we want people to actually care about the figures on the table. You know, we don't want to see them throw the lives of their miniature men away uh, just because they can. So actually creating those personas does create a link between the players and the men on the tabletop. And women, of course, in some situations. And this was something we wanted to emphasise when we set about creating a campaign system. It was already there in our approach, but we wanted to make it really hardwired into the a campaign system. Our objective was to obviously create a, camp, a campaign system which allows the gamer to um, enjoy some of the you know, most famous actions of World War II um, because it, we certainly feel that playing games in a campaign removes them from that artificial vacuum that a one-off game so often is in and puts them within a bigger picture places them within a, within a bigger operational picture. Setting a number of games in that operational context allows scenarios to emerge which you wouldn't get in a pickup game, and I think that's really great. 
Um, you know, you, you can have games where you know that you're not going to be holding the table by the end of the game, but you, you still can achieve some key objectives which are going to help you in the next game. Maybe you want to delay the enemy in order to gain time. Maybe you want to do maximum damage to the enemy, but with absolute minimal damage to your own troops. And that could be a relatively quick game where you, you know, ambush, hit hard, and then uh, disappear, uh, surrendering the ground to the enemy, but having slightly um, uh, shifted the balance of the scales uh, in your favour. Now, um, our first building block was the six scenarios in the main rule book. These these were actually originally designed to mirror the real life phases of battle. You know, from the intelligence gathering of the patrol and the probe scenarios to the assault with the attack and defend, and then the breakthrough, um, breakthrough and even breakout stage uh, with um, the delaying action, the flank attack, the attack on a final objective. All of that representing the more fluid battles during the uh, exploitation phase. Um, And there you've pretty much got the components that you need to represent most actions that you'll ever come across um, in pretty much all wars, really. Um, They consequently perfectly suit the ladder campaign that we adopted. In fact, the six scenarios had been designed so that they could be played as a sequential campaign in their own right. So they, they just plugged straight into that. But what we then wanted was a system that wasn't just going to be about the battle, it was also going to be about the men on the ground, and that focus on the sharp end of war. Now, as you go through a campaign, there will be decisions to be made about how you reorganise your forces to try and maintain your combat capability as best you can. Uh, You know, once you start to take losses, um, are you going to? How are you going to group things together? It's an opportunity to try out tactical ideas that you know people tried out historically. Do you want to? group all your Bren guns together in one big gun group and then uh, have another large group of uh, as a manoeuvre element with just your riflemen. That's all entirely up to you as you start to lose casualties and really have to make those decisions. You also have to keep an eye on um, things like how many blokes are in the dressing station, you know, when they're going to be coming back to their unit. You'll you'll see how that your your decisions impact on your men, how how your achievements play out with your boss and how the stress of command affects you as the platoon commander. Now, all of these are interesting from the perspective of creating a narrative, but also, and I think this is really important, that they do have a tangible impact on the game. You know, if your men are unhappy, your force morale will be lower. If your boss is unhappy, the amount of support you're going to get will be reduced. How your personal feeling will influence the mood of your platoon. Now, these are all considerations which will influence how you play each game and hopefully um, give a really enhanced gaming experience. But yeah, the inspiration was very much coming from those books which look at and analyse the impact of warfare on men, not just on the thickness of armour plate or the calibre of a gun. (laughs) 